And I'm so thankful that Jesus is our Savior, that he is our friend. Amen, church? Yeah. You know, we, uh, we don't find many friends in the world today. I mean, we do have some, no question. But they're rare, they're few. But in Christ, we always have a friend. We always have a Savior. And I'm so thankful for that. Thank you so much for that. So I want to thank the, uh, the children for the, man, beautiful, amen, praise the Lord. You know, it brought memories, it brought flashbacks. Andrew brought flashbacks to me because as a kid, that's what we did. You know, every 13th Sabbath, they will roll up all the kids from Sabbath school. All right, do your part, sing, say a memory verse. And then, like, Christmas programs, we were, and I was so, I was like, oh, I don't want to do this. But, you know, it, it, it trains me. <laughs> it trains me. And so I, I you know, so seeing our, our, young, our young people, our children participating, singing, praising the Lord. I, I, I recall the words of Jesus, you know. I mean, man, let the children sing. Let them praise God. If not, you know, the stones will cry out. <laughs> no, but let them sing. Let them praise the Lord. The Pharisees try to cut them off. So I told Jesus, shut them down. Jesus says, oh, no. <laughs> they're going to sing because they're praising God. And I'm so blessed by that. Thank you so much. I want to thank our health nugget as well. Our health nugget, our health ministry team, they always do a fantastic job. Thank you so much for um, the, the tidbits, the, the, the wealth of knowledge. Charcoal, I've used it every now and then, and man, I'm telling you, it's, it is a beautiful thing. I know many of us here can testify to that, so thank you so much for sharing that. Um, before I go into our sermon this morning, I um, want to do the first reading for the membership transfer of Mark and Carolyn Barger from Pittsburgh Church to the Joplin Church. So this is our first reading for their transfer, membership transfer here to Joplin Church. Amen. Before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we are so blessed, Lord, to be here. We're so thankful, Lord, that you're our Savior, you're our God. We pray, Lord, that you will bless our, our word, our study as we engage, Lord. May we be listening and reading your word with an open heart to understand your word. We ask for your spirit to guide and to lead us. Thank you for everything in the person of Jesus that you have given us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. In the world of sports, there are many superstars and big-name athletes from um, around the world that fans follow and idolize. And I kind of use that word a little carefully, but uh, some people do idolize a lot of these sports stars. For example, basketball has Michael Jordan, LeBron James, Shaquille O'Neal. Football has Tom Brady. Here's Patrick Mahomes. Am I right, Patrick Mahomes? Any Mahomes fans out there? <laughs> amen, amen. Uh, soccer, we have soccer, Lionel Messi, you know. This is just a tiny sampling of superstars from sports. Um, baseball is another sport with superstars, and we can read about, you know, the great Bambino, Babe Ruth, or well, we can research, you know, Babe Ruth, um, Barry Bonds, um, a lot of these stars here that we can see, Sandy Koufax and all that. Um, one interesting retired baseball player is Pete Rose, Pete Rose. Pete Rose, born on April 14th, 1941 in Cincinnati, Ohio. Pete played ba uh, baseball and football at Western Hills High School. Um, when Rose reached his senior year, he had used up his four years of sports and eligibility. So in the spring of 1960, he joined the Class AA team sponsored by Freak uh, Big Boy of Lebanon, Ohio in the Dayton Amateur League. He played catcher, second base, shortstop. And compiled a 626 batting average. Man, 626. That's pretty impressive there. This would have been the pinnacle of, of, of Pete Rose's baseball career, if not for the help of his uncle, Buddy Blue Bomb. Blue Bomb was a bird dog scout for the Reds, the Cincinnati Reds, and he pleaded his nephew's case to the Reds. And so the Reds, who had recently just traded away several prospects who turned out to be very good, decided to take a chance on Rose. And so upon his graduation from high school, Rose signed a professional contract with the Cincinnati Reds. And he played for his whole entire career span for the Reds, the Phillies, Philadelphia Phillies, the Montreal Expos, and he ended up going back to the Cincinnati Reds. As a professional baseball player, his career began from 1963 to 1986. During and after his playing career, he served as the Reds manager from 1984 to 1989. So 84, he was still serving as a player, player slash manager, and then he retired as a player in 86, but he retired as a manager in 89. And this is where it gets interesting for Pete. See, in his last year, 
as the manager for the Reds, three years after he retired as a player, the office of the commissioner of the Major League Baseball permanently bans Rose from baseball. And the reason for the ban is the accusation that Rose gambled on baseball games while he played and managed the Reds. Maybe you've heard the story. Maybe you have. And these charges claim that he bet on his own team, on his team, the Reds. So imagine him as a player there during, uh, from eight, um, before he retired in 86, and then as a manager when he retired in 89. You know, he bet on his own team as a manager and as a player. And some might argue, man, that's not a big deal, but others would say, you know, hold on. Uh, if Rose had placed a bet on a game involving his team, he could have influenced the game's outcome, either as a player or a manager. You, you see the point? You know, if, if the Reds were, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know anything about betting. Um, um, they were, if they were to win by a certain amount of runs, then if you bet this amount of money, you would win this amount of money. I don't know. Uh, I've, I've never betted. But you know, he, he, if he was able to influence a game, place a bet, and then influence the outcome of the game, you know, it's, there seems to be something fishy there. In fact, there's a whole ethical issue there, and, and Rose is gambling. And so some sports writers and historians, they view Rose's gambling as a massive scandal in the sports arena. There are scandals in many parts of the world and various elements of life. Who can forget the Enron scandal? What about the scandal in the royal family, Princess Charles and Princess Diana? A more recent scandal is the Theranos scandal. And as we speak, the hot topic on social media is Elon Musk, Musk releasing the Twitter files. And that's a big scandal. <laughs> I'm not here to comment on what, all of that, but I'm just saying there's a lot of going around the world today. We live and abide, it seems like, in a world of scandals. And according to the online Webster Dictionary, a scandal can either be a, either be a noun or a verb. As a noun... Our dictionary gives about five definitions. As a verb, there are two definitions. But I want to work with the basis, pr basic premise of the noun. So a scandal, and I was reading it, and I was like, okay, how can I synthesize this into a one simple definition? So a scandal, based on what I was reading, is an action or situation that goes against what the community or culture has established is proper or moral. I repeat, a scandal is an action or situation that goes against what the community or culture has established is proper or moral. So there are several takeaways from this definition that I would like to highlight. First, a scandal involves someone or a group committing or performing an act or being in a situation or circumstance. Second, this scandalous act or problem occurs in a community or culture. It is not done in isolation. It could be done in secret, but like most other scandals, it comes to the light. Third, this act goes against the established tenets of the community or culture. It might challenge the community's propriety or the culture's morals. So thus, this minimally explains the outrage when an act is revealed in the light of what is proper or moral in the eyes of the community and culture. In other words, once a scandal breaks out, and when they judge it against what the community and culture seems as what is proper and moral, and they say, oh man, there is some big disagreement there. There is an outrage in the community. So many years ago, we discovered what could only be a scandal in ancient times. It involved a young woman named Mary, an older gentleman named Joseph, and an unborn child. But while this was a scandal, and I'm going to just put that there in scandal in quotation marks, in the bigger picture, it fulfilled God's design purpose. So let's reread our passage in Matthew chapter 1. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 1, and we're going to reread our passage just so that we have, you know, the, the passage in our mind and our thinking. Matthew chapter 1, reading from, verses eight, from verse 18 to 25. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 to 25. And if you're there, say amen, church. And we also have it on the screen. Thank you. Beginning at verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. 
And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a child, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet. Verse 23, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus called his name Jesus. So what is happening in our passage this morning? The passage's emphasis is in the opening line of verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. Matthew is trying to grab his audience and to understand and experience the impact of this opening line. It, 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 it brings in the context of the genealogy list from verses 1 to 17 to a very heightened expectation. We read chapter uh, verse 1 to 17, then he begat he, he begat them, and so forth and so on. Interesting talk, but this list here is filled with exciting characters, monumental events, and anticipated hopes. Matthew establishes that Jesus was the continuation and fulfillment of this Old Testament prophecy. This list is coming to the point of Christ. Jesus is where this list is ending up at. And this happened through a young girl. Her name was Mary. She was engaged to a man named Joseph. And, Mo, and, and Matthew points out that Mary is his mother. The gospel writers portrayed the relationship between Jesus and Mary as one of love and respect. Especially in John's gospel. Probably the most touching depiction of this love is when John pens that Jesus gave John the task of caring for his mother. He says, your mother, <laughs> your son. Jesus loved his mother. He loved her. However, before he was born, Mary was engaged to Joseph. And the text tells us that before they came together, she was found with a child from the Holy Spirit. Now, Mary knew this before Joseph. Remember when Gabriel came to Mary and announced that she would conceive and bear a son in her womb? This is in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. This is before Joseph discovers this. And so the 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 the, the the angel Gabriel tells her that you will bear a son, and the Holy Spirit will come upon her and perform this miracle. Thus, she knew what was happening. This is the miracle of the incarnation. It is something that we can't explain other than the Holy Spirit performing this miraculous act of placing in, uh, in Mary a baby boy. A baby boy. But Joseph, in our text this morning, has just found out. What was Joseph's initial reaction? What, what, did he, what, what, did he, what did he conclude? Well, first, Joseph is a righteous man. The text says that. It says just here, but the word is dikaios, uh, which is righteous. So he is a righteous man. He is a, uh, an outstanding Jewish man in his community. He is righteous. And because of this, he was unwilling to shame her publicly by divorcing her publicly. To, to, to divorce her publicly because as a righteous man, he says, hold on, I can, you know, I, I, can, I can put her forth and say, hey, man, something is wrong here. Something has happened here. It, it takes two to tangle, amen? And he didn't understand what's going on. And his thinking, he's like, man, this, this, wait a minute, something is wrong here. And so, you know, he could have he said, I'm going to divorce you. But he was a righteous he says, man, wait, this, to do this to her would really, really destroy her. And so the underlying system of Joseph, really, he is thinking from the system that they had in those days and is prevalent today, honor and shame. That is a system that people operate from. Honor and shame dictated his actions. And honor refers to a person publicly acknowledged for his worth by the community. So in other words, oh, man, I want the community to see me as an honorable person. And this was granted based on how fully that person embodies the qualities and behaviors valued by the community. And the opposite end of the spectrum is shame. So there's honor and shame. This means that a person will live in such a way that they will not bring disgrace upon themselves. In Joseph's case, he didn't want to lose face, uh, face in the eye of the public 
but at the same time try to be respectful of Mary's public persona. Sadly, Joseph's value system of honor and shame blocked him from seeing or understanding what God was trying to do. Now, we're not told if Mary explained it to him that she was with child from the Holy Spirit. Maybe she, she, maybe she did try to explain to him. We're not too sure. We're not, we don't sense that in the text right now. Nevertheless, <clears throat> Joseph could not see what God was doing through the faithful submission of Mary. Joseph overlooked the miracle of God in placing baby Jesus in the womb of Mary. Humanity in his manufactured system will surely not see God's outrageous act of love. He missed it. God is doing something powerful, mighty in here. And he was built and he was thinking upon his own system. What would happen to me? What would happen to her? How would we look? And he missed out right there at that point what God was trying to do. Mary accepted God's plan. On the other hand, Joseph is stuck in his value system of honor and shame. How many of us this morning is stuck in our system and thinking when we come to the word of God? It has to fit my way. It has to fit what I believe. It has to fit what it says. Instead of saying, Lord, I want to surrender to your word and learn what your word is saying for my life. So what does God do to help Joseph? Because, you know, God doesn't want to leave Joseph out in the cold. (laughs) God is, we need to do something here. So Joseph needed time to process what he had discovered. And Matthew uses a Greek word here that means to ponder deeply, think very carefully, process slowly. In other words, Joseph did not immediately dismiss the circumstances. While he did not understand the situation, he was willing to ponder it. He was willing to really think about it. And this is the position a person needs to have if they desire to understand. It is in this position that God was able to speak to Joseph. So we need to have a humble attitude when we come in, when we're studying and when we're looking to the things of God and trying to understand life itself. What is going on? It is in this humble position that God was now able to speak to Joseph. So the angel of the Lord appears to Joseph in a dream. And he says, Joseph, son of David, son of David. This is a a very uh, important title. It tells us that Joseph comes from the line of David. Even deeper, the title carried prophetic connotations. Matthew employs the phrase, the son of David, nine times in his gospel. Eight of those are connected directly to Jesus. Only Jesus has that title, except for this one time. This is the only time where the title Son of David is connected to someone else, uh, someone other than Christ. So why does the angel refer to Joseph with the title Son of David? Why? Why is that so important that the angel would have to say something like that in, in his talk with Joseph in his dream? So the angel's address to Joseph as the Son of David reminds us What is at stake in the decision of Joseph that he has just reached? The loss of Jesus' royal pedigree, if he is not officially recognized as Joseph's son. If he is not recognized as Joseph's son, he will not be seen as the son of David. So despite his previous decision, he is called to take two decisive actions. First, to accept Mary as his wife rather than repudiating her. And secondly, to give give her son a name that will confirm his legal recognition of Jesus as his son and hence also as a son of David. So the importance of this was he is, Joseph is being reminded your title and understand that your title will be passed on to this boy and so this boy can be recognized as the son of David. So the angel has given him this, 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 this wonderful idea and he says that you are living in fear. You are thinking and living in fear and let me tell you this is the basic premise of honor and shame. This is the bottom line of honor and shame. It is rooted in fear. That's what he's saying. He's been living in honor and shame, and now he says, don't live in fear. So this is, it is rooted in fear. This is another form of anxiety when a person lives his life not to lose face before the public. We live to the beat of the public's drum, so we don't incur the disapproval or dislikes of society. Oh, don't dislike me on social media. And people are living in fear because they want to be honored. They don't want to feel shame. Instead, we need to look to what God has done for us, which is what the angel directed Joseph to do. The angel continues by telling God's future and purpose for the baby. First, Mary will bear a son. And this is such a 
simple statement from Matthew, yet the, 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 the deep, profound thought in the sense that Mary will bring into the world the Messiah. Man. Gabriel came to her with this message. This was in Luke chapter 1. Um, he said, he will be great and will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord will give him the throne of his father, David. David, son of David, David Davidic king. And he will honor, he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And there will be no end of his kingdom. That's Luke 1, 32 and 33. This son is the promised Messiah who is the true Davidic king. The longing and desire of the ages are about, is about to come forth from the womb of a virgin. And Joseph had the tremendous responsibility of naming this baby boy. The solemnity of naming a child was serious business. Naming of a male child took place formally at the time of circumcision on the eighth day after birth. Names held far more important uh, weight in that culture than in ours being thought of as linked with or pointing to the actual character or destination of the individual. And so the name Jesus, chosen by God for his son, was in that day and for centuries before a very common name. This was a very common name in the Jewish society, and it has special meaning. Jesus is the uh, Greek equivalent of the Hebrew uh, Joshua. So Greek is um, <coughs> uh, Jesus, Hebrew uh, uh, for Joshua is uh, Yeshua, and meaning Yahweh is salvation. Yahweh is so this was a very common name that they used back in those days in their culture. And Jewish boys for centuries have been given the name Jesus with the frequency of today's John or, or, or James. Or, and, you know, all the names that are very common. And this reflects in part the hope of the Jewish parents for God's salvation from centuries and centuries of oppression under succession of world power. In other words, when they were naming their child, they were hoping and thinking and just waiting for freedom from oppression. So God's choice of such a common name, when he could have chosen something unique, also emphasized that Jesus came in a way that identified with the average Joe, with them, you and I, amen? You and I. He came in to love, to become one of us, so that we might be drawn to him and become one of his. Jesus was approachable and touchable. He was one of us. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, Hebrews 4, 15. Jesus did everything to build bridges to us, amen. Amid this scandal, the angel proclaims the salvation of the world amid this scandal. So what did Joseph do, though, after this dream? What did he do? Well, the expectant father arose from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. Something noteworthy is happening in the, in the Greek of verse 24. Joseph awakened and did. The word awakened or woke or being raised, uh, and this, this is some of the English translations of the Greek word diagathis, tells us that Joseph got up from his sleep. At the same time, the word getting up, arising, awaking, is really pushing us forward uh, uh, to what Joseph did. Joseph performed, Joseph did it, so he didn't just awake, but he did. He went out and he did something. And so Matthew is leading us to Joseph's actions after he rose from sleep. Joseph awoke with a purpose. He said, I'm going to get up and I, there's something I need to do because God has said something to me. So God has ignited his heart with direction and an objective. The discovery of truth should set our hearts ablaze with love for God. Amen? And, and, our, and out of that love, we are looking to do what God is asking us to do. Joseph takes Mary as his wife. And that's what verse 25 comes down to. Joseph takes Mary. This is, he awoke and he did. And so he took Mary as his wife. And then Matthew shares an inspired, interesting thought here. Joseph had no intimate time with Mary until she gave birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. Now our passage here has employed the prophecy of Isaiah 7 14 three times. Verse 21, real quickly, look at verse 21. Um, we're just going to go quickly through three verses here. Verse 21, and she will bear a son and you will call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. All right, that's verse 21. Verse 23 then, we come down to, he's quoting Isaiah 714, Matthew says, 
the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. They shall call his name Emmanuel. Finally, Matthew repeats his words in the sense of a fulfillment in verse 25. Verse 25 says, she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. So there is a predictive element that's happening here. And we can see that most of these elements are very similar. She will bear, the virgin shall conceive and bear, she had given birth. A son is repeated three times in, all, in verse 21, 23, and 25. And then um, you shall call his name Jesus. She, they shall call his name Emmanuel, and he called his name Jesus. So the repetition of the verse is amazing. Now, there are slight variations, but notice that there is a prediction and then a fulfillment. It began in Isaiah's time. It's reiterated by the angel of the Lord to Mary, first in Luke 1, and then to Joseph in a dream. The power of God's prophetic word is coming forth. God says uh, in Isaiah, this was back in 737 B.C., around there, around that time, when the, the word is given from Isaiah to Ahaz. And then, while there is a bit of a fulfillment in that time, the ultimate fulfillment, the greater fulfillment, the larger fulfillment is now found here. And so here, we see that there is uh, uh, an element of being predicted and being fulfilled. You see, the power of God's prophetic word is found in its fulfillment and realization. Amen. When God says, I'm going to call it as it is, and then when it happens, we can trust God with everything. Amen. And so here... There's an actual, um, um, we see an actual historical application of prophecy in Isaiah's time. At the time, its type points us to a larger and more powerful reality. And this is Joseph and Mary's scandal. <clears throat> she will bear a son. He shall call his name Jesus, Emmanuel. Thus, um, Matthew points out that the birth of Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of Isaiah 7, 14. However, notice, notice that the angel of the Lord has introduced another element that is not mentioned in Isaiah's prophecy. For he will save his people from their sins. Man. Now, Matthew does not even include this in his uh, fulfillment of prophetic elements in verse 25. He doesn't say that, but it's implied in the name, because in his name, for he will save his people from their sins. So the context, the angel adds another predictive element to the prophecy. And this seems to be in the future from the time of the child's birth. In other words, when Christ would come, and when Christ is here, at some point after his birth, he is going to be doing some act that will save his people from their sins. And note, once again, this comes out of the scandal that was there in that time. See, God provides the only person who can provide salvation for us, and that's Jesus Christ. This Sabbath, we have kind of looked at the situation and circumstance of Joseph and Mary. And in our Western mind, their incident would probably, in, in, in our culture as it is now, it would be like, oh, that's, that's, that's a normal thing. Uh, husband or, or, or an engaged couple, you know, having a baby out of wedlock. That, that happens. You know, that's, that's not a big deal. And even in our church, it might be like that. But for the most part, the world won't pay any attention to it. Like, okay, that's, you know, that's, that's normal. However, in their time, in their community, in their culture, Joseph and Mary's case would have been the talk of the town. It would have made front page news in the local paper. The situation would have been a scandal of epic proportions. But Joseph and Mary's humiliation fulfilled God's divine purpose. If this is true, then God created this, and I'm going to put in quotation marks, scandalous situation. However, God is good, right? God is love. God is good. So it stands to reason that God was really working out something greater, something bigger and larger in mind, even though it came to the disgrace, it seems like, of Joseph and Mary. You know, we can probably say that God orchestrated a beneficial plan for us in the worst scenario. And this orchestration began in God's heart of outrageous love. Man, outrageous love. We, we just don't know. And the evidence of this heart of love is the act of love as seen in the miracle of Jesus condescension and incarnation the bible tells us that god gave his only begotten son he took on the infirmities of degenerate humanity after four thousand years it was not the ideal situation given our predicament 
but our thoughts on what should be correct and proper and how God expresses his love for us could be contrary to God's principle. We think that, God, you should love like this. But God says, hold on. My love is larger than what you think. <laughs> there is no way that this is right. There's no way that God can love like this. To send his son in a world as it is. No way. And not only that, but even in the situation, why not just select a married couple? But no, God says, I have my ways to express this love. You know, the Pharisees and scribes accused Jesus of dispensing the grace of God too frivolously. No, there, God, Jesus, you're just too gracious. You're too loving. This is beyond that. And they condemn Jesus with the accusation, this man receiveth sinners. That was the condemnation of Christ. It's, this man receiveth sinners. And Ellen shares this word. Christ Object Lessons 186. The souls who came to Jesus felt in his presence that even for them, there was an escape from the pit of sin. In the presence of Christ, those who were caught up in sin felt that they could escape from sin in the presence of Jesus. The Pharisees had only scorn and condemnation for them. Wow. But Christ greeted them as children of God, estranged indeed from the Father's house, but not forgotten by the Father's heart. Did you catch the point? You see, the Pharisees and scribes, oh, when they saw sinners, oh, man, you're terrible, you're bad, no good, scorn and condemnation. But Christ greeted them, it says here, as children of God, estranged indeed, yeah, they were lost, they were outside, no question, but not forgotten by the Father's heart. And their very misery and sin made them only the more objects of his compassion. Jesus literally said, oh, man, you are so bad, but that makes me love you even more. I want to save you. And the farther they had wandered from him, the more earnest the longing and the greater the sacrifice for their rescue. Wow. In the context of God's redeeming love, a person senses their need for freedom from the bondage of sin. In the context of God's redeeming love, knowing that God loves us to connect us to him, resulting in liberty from the prism of sin, we can embrace God's future for our lives. This future is a growing relationship with Jesus. It starts here and now because this is where Jesus met us. Amen. This is where God with us came. Our Lord incarnated in our world. He came to identify himself with the interests and needs of humanity. But it doesn't end there. It's, it's not just, it doesn't end here. <laughs> the power of growing closer and closer to Christ extends into eternity. Wow. Thus, the future is not centered around a place a reward, or an exciting excursion around the universe. Beloved, the end, resolves, or the end revolves around an ever-deepening love for God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. All of creation, both the redeemed and the unfallen world, Desire of Ages, chapter 1, read it, and the unfallen world will find in the cross their science and song. God has declared the future from the past. And this truth should inspire us with an infectious purpose. God has done everything so we can inherit the blessings of the future. Amen. Thus, we should seek to share our Father's love and gifts with others. As we give others the prophetic realization of the saints' of future life with Jesus, our passion as well as others, uh, as well as theirs for God, will only deepen. And if there is a time when we need to hear about God's future, it is now. Amen. Our current situation is getting worse. There is no worse scenario than the one we are currently living in. The world is ripe with sin. From country to country, nation to nation, people groups to people groups, moral corruption seems to be the norm. This tells me that sin, for the most part, is, expe is expected and indulged. But this is why God's plan is scandalous. I mean that God's actions contradict the world's expectation of sin. John the Beloved tells us not to love the world or the things in the world. In its current condition, the world is the source of the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. This is the standard underpinnings and fabric of the world. Therefore, God does something that goes against the grain of this world. It goes against what is proper in this world. It goes against whatever is defined as moral in this world. His action challenges the philosophy of worldly living. 
His work is contrary to the deeds of this world. God sends his version of a scandal into this world. By scandal, I mean it is contrary to the DNA of the current world as it is. Do you want to know what God's scandal is? Do you want to know what God's scandalous uh, uh, intervention is here in this world? Here it is. Jesus saves. Because the devil don't want to lose you. The devil doesn't want to, he's doing all that he can to keep us in sin. But then God sends the the power and the thought. You know what, devil? My son saves. People can be free from sin. Amen? Because the Bible says that he came here to save us from sin. Please know, Jesus' heart, passion, power, and love is to pull us out of the mud that we are in. Not to leave us in it. He he wants to pull us out from sin. And so the scandal, the scandal (laughs) of God in this sinful world is that Jesus saves. And he saves his brother. He saves his sister. Doesn't matter where we're at. Doesn't matter what we're doing. Right now, if by faith we say, Lord, please, please, I need your salvation. Let me tell you, God hears it and God answers it. And he says, yes. You're my son, you're my daughter. Let's rise and sing for our closing song, Jesus Saves. Let the name 